What's up guys? In this video, I'm focusing on covering diffusion models. So basically the family of models that are powering some of the most famous uh, AI models over the last couple of months, such as, uh, I guess, Dali2, uh, Imagine from Google, uh, Glide uh, from OpenAI as well, and uh, many other models. So the idea, the, 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 the video will be quite uh, ambitious, so I'll try and first walk you through uh, two of the seminal papers behind uh, diffusion models, and then I'm gonna actually go through the, the code base. So the skimming of the paper just serves the purpose of me showing you the formulas, the mathematical formulas, which we can then map and relate to actual code. So it's not gonna be a deep dive into the papers per se, but hopefully uh, this gives you the uh, necessary context to kind of later on cope with the, with the actual code. Okay, having said that, I'm covering two papers. Uh, one is Denosing Diffusion Probabilistic Models. That's pretty much the paper that um, made uh, diffusion models uh, practical. And then I'm gonna cover Improved Denoising Diffusion um, Probabilistic Models from OpenAI. And I'm actually gonna be covering uh, like the code base behind this paper. Okay, but let's start with this one. So this is gonna introduce the necessary basics. If you haven't already uh, like learned anything about diffusion models, hopefully that's gonna be some uh, context for you. Uh, I did cover the Glide paper, so I did cover some diffusion models there, so do check it out, I'm gonna link it somewhere here. But uh, this, this video, having said that, this video is fairly uh, self-contained, uh, so yeah, you can continue watching. Okay, so here is how the diffusion model looks like on a, on, a, on a high level. So the idea is you start from an image here, and then you slowly, gradually start adding Gaussian noise on top of your image. So that's called the, the forward uh, diffusion process. And uh, ultimately you end up with an image such as this one, which is, as you can see here, basically a complete, uh, complete noise of an image. Uh, and now, if you learn how to reverse this process, so this is the forward process here, as you can see. If you learn how to rever reverse this process, so denoted as P, uh, sub, like theta, uh, if we learn how to do that, then basically if we start a training procedure and we learn to do this for all of the images in our data set, you eventually learn the underlying data distribution and then you can basically start from a random noise sample and start uh, denoising that image until you end up with a hallucinated uh, new image from your underlying data distribution. So it's gonna be a novel image, obviously. Okay, so that's a very high level um, explanation there. Let me now walk you through the formulas. So again, this is, the, this is the, how the um, like forward process looks like. Uh, this is the um, basically uh, the joint distribution. And uh, if we wanna sample uh, from, from like, if we wanna do one step of the uh, like reverse process, here's how we do it. So basically we are going to learn a neural network that's gonna predict uh, the mu of theta and the sigma of theta, which are basically the, the mean and the variance of the Gaussian. So now like there, there is a bunch of theory for why this is possible. So th they show that if you have steps small enough, uh, basically, um, that means that if your forward process is uh, like adding Gaussians, they show that you can also approximate the reverse process as, as, a, as, a, as, a, as like sampling from a Gaussian. So it's not, not kind of completely obvious why this is the, the fact, but uh, yeah, we'll have to take it for, for granted. So the idea is to learn those two. Uh, let's continue here. So here is the actual forward process. You can see how we sample from the forward process here. Uh, basically, you, you kind of downscale the, the current image, and then, uh, so this is how you form the mean. You take the current image, uh, you downscale it, and basically then you, you have this um, like uh, covariance matrix, and then you just sample from, the, uh, from, from this Gaussian here to end up with the uh, x of t, okay? So again, uh, we condition on the x t minus one, and by sampling from this distribution here, we end up with xt, okay? So that's basically going from here all the way to here. That's one step. Um, what's, what's next? So now they, they showed that you can basically train these models by optimizing this variational um, uh, bound. Uh, the idea is, so here we have the log likelihood of our data. 
we want to obviously maximize. We want to fit to, to tweak our model such that all of the data points from our data set are super likely under our model. So that's the idea how we train most of these, like all of these um, pretty much uh, generative models, not only diffusion models. And uh, now this is a standard uh, thing uh, with variational uh, bounds. Basically, you find a surrogate uh, loss, uh, which is like a lower bound uh, basically uh, for, 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 for this loss here. And then by maximizing it, uh, basically you're certain that, that the likelihood of your data is gonna be at least as big. So that's, that's, the, that's the main idea there. Uh, now I'm not gonna dig into formulas here. We're gonna later see how they decompose this into, into an actual, actual expression that's gonna be leveraged later on in the code. But here is the, the equation for now. Now this is an important, this here is a super important finding. So instead of having to sample every, so during the forward process, instead of having to sample uh, multiple times, and in practice they use thousand steps, uh, they show you can literally sample uh, arbitrary x of t starting from x0, where x0 is your original image, uh, by sampling from this Gaussian here. So these are some important coefficients we'll be seeing in the code as well. So we have these alpha t's, which are one minus beta t's, beta t's, and beta is basically, as, as, as you can see here, it's basically just um, like your, your, your covariance matrix here. Uh, in practice, the original DTPM, so this paper here, uh, used fixed, uh, like, uh, uh, fixed schedules, whereas uh, the later papers, such as the one from OpenAI, the improved one, uh, used a learnable, uh, like uh, like schedules. And when I say a schedule, I just mean how does beta vary when we go across the whole for forward uh, process. Uh, then there is this alpha um, alpha uh, t bar, which is just a product of all of these alphas, which are defined here, from starting from one all the way to t. Okay, so one is the we start from the uh, Usually one is denoted as the start of the process before the image has been deteriorated. And then as T grows, we're going towards uh, image becoming pure Gaussian noise. Okay, so here is the expression. You basically can use uh, square root of this alpha T bar, multiply that. So we multiply the original image here. This is how we form the variance. And then we just sample from this distribution and we get the X of T. So that means we immediately get arbitrarily uh, no noisy image. Nice. Um, I mentioned the, the, the loss we'll be using. So here is the loss just uh, reshaped into a different form. So this is the form that's gonna be actionable. So this is the form we'll be using in the code. We have L0, uh, LT minus one and LT. So these are kind of three classes of, uh, uh, of, of, of similar, of, of similar uh, components here. Um, this one is super important, basically KL divergence between uh, this here, as you can see, is the one step of the reverse process. And we're gonna do a KL divergence with this uh, basically uh, forward process uh, posterior, okay? And then we have this component, which will actually, in this paper, they can ignore it because uh, this is gonna be um, like uh, pure, pure Gaussian and uh, because they don't learn the, the, the variances, basically you can ignore this term here. And uh, this one here is basically the, the, the negative log likelihood of, of the image uh, conditioned on the, on the uh, previous step. Anyways, um, a lot of details I'm gonna have to kind of hand wave explain all of this just for you to understand and see the formulas. That's the important part. Uh, okay, so let's see what's up What's up here. So uh, we can actually calculate, that's a cool thing. We can calculate this um, posterior uh, of the forward process um, analytically here. Uh, and you can see how, how this mu, mu t uh, tilde is computed and you can see how beta uh, tilde is computed here. So these expressions are all gonna be in the code. Uh, so just kind of take mental notes here. Although I'll be comparing uh, the formulas with code uh, like side by side, so that's gonna probably be useful for you guys. Uh, so anyways, because we have, uh, this is a Gaussian uh, and this is a Gaussian, that means we'll end up, uh, when, when you do the KL divergence between two Gaussians, you end up with simple analytical expressions. We're gonna see those uh, a bit later. Okay. so. What, what's up next? So actually here, so here is how these LT minus ones are gonna simplify to. So we simplify them to, to these expressions here. Um, basically we just find the MSE, uh, so the um, mean squared error between the means. So this is gonna be our learnable one. This is the, the, the one we get from the uh, forward posterior. Uh, and that can be further uh, like 
basically just simple algebra here because we know that xt equals this and that's from the, the so-called nice property here. So that's this property here. So you can kind of imagine that sampling from this Gaussian is actually uh, equivalent to computing the following expression. So if you want to get xt, you basically do the following. So you do this square root alpha t bar x0 and you basically add plus square root because this is variance we want to have like standard deviation so minus alpha bar t so it's going to be under square root and then we just multiply uh, times uh, epsilon which where epsilon is just basically your your normal distribution uh, okay so that's the gaussian with the mean of zero and uh, variance of one okay so let's go back here uh, and then we just plug in xt here so we uh, sorry we, we just calculate x0 here we just kind of do the algebra and then we plug it in here and this is the next expression and then this simplifies because we know how this is computed up here so here is how we compute that one so it's just like a bunch of manipulations of symbols and uh, I'm I'm kind of scheme, I'm skimming over it. So you end up with this expression and then you basically, this is what you want your, your neural network to learn. So this is gonna be your diffusion model. It's gonna learn how to predict uh, the, the, the noise uh, here. Okay, so let's see, that simplifies to what? Uh, basically we want to have the, the learnable uh, uh, like uh, mean needs to be equal to uh, whatever we had here. So we basically want to have this thing we want to, it to be like the same as this uh, term here because then the loss will obviously go to zero. That's what I uh, show here. And if we achieve that, if we learn that uh, mean, then how we sample, how we'll be sampling from the re reverse process is again a simple computation. So here's the mean. So that's the same expression as this one here. And then we just add the uh, basically standard deviation uh, times the uh, this vector here, which is going to be uh, sample from a normal distribution okay and ultimately when you simplify even further that expression you end up uh, with this uh, type of parameterization so you can either learn a neural network that's going to predict the mean or you can learn instead just this this term here just the the actual noise and that's what I uh, end up doing so this expression as you can see is just a like mean squared error between the uh, like sample noise so we're, so we're basically learning what type of a noise was uh, added to our image. And then we have these um, weights for each of our terms LT minus one. So this is again, this is LT minus one. Those are the loss components we saw. And we're gonna see that this weight basically uh, is a function of the step in the diffusion process. Okay, I know, I know this is a lot of formulas. Uh, bear with me, it's gonna become much easier as, as the video progresses because I'm gonna start introducing code as well. But let me quickly just explain what this means. So we start from an image here. This is uh, some uh, image. And then uh, basically we uh, add on top of it some noise. It's gonna be some, some, something inside of there. Like, like let me just draw some human being. And then after adding the noise uh, like this, let me change the color. So let's imagine we added a bunch of noise here. So now your diffusion model is learning uh, this green stuff. And if it learns the green stuff, then you basically know how to go backwards, okay? So you learn the green stuff, the, the noise, that's the epsilon here, and you know how to denoise your images. Cool, it's kind of magical. Um, it doesn't click, uh, you probably won't understand it immediately. It's not completely straightforward to understand why this works. I'm still struggling to be honest, but uh, the formulas are here and we're gonna follow them for the time being. Okay, I'm gonna skip this and starting from this um, LT minus one, they, they uh, basically derive empirically this simplified objective where they drop the term here. So the term that depends on the um, basically time step of the diffusion process and we end up with this one here and so as you can see uh, basically we're doing simple msc loss between the noise so we are trying to predict this this noise added on top of the image and we do that for various uh, time steps of the diffusion process so basically what we are doing again is we start from an, uh, from an image here uh, we add some noise on top of it we end with an image and then we keep on doing that for like let's say thousand steps and we end up here 
and basically we'll be trying to at each step of the way understand which noise was added here which noise was added here which noise was added here and by doing that we learn the 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 the, the, the reverse process of the diffusion and that's going to lead us to like a powerful generative model cool uh let's continue here let me just show you so here are some images they get from the model uh, not that important because you already know that these models are super powerful. So here you can see how the diffusion process looks like in practice. You start with the noisy image and then gradually keep on denoising it until you get to the uh, sampled image, which is the image sample from the underlying data distribution. Okay, here they show how depending on from which latent you start from, if you start from a latent like X thousand, so that means thousand steps of diffusion, and then you start three independent reverse processes because they are stochastic, you end up with three different images. But as soon as we start taking um, like latents that come from later in the reverse process, so let's say X uh, five, uh, 500, then you can see that three independent uh, reverse processes lead to images that are quite similar. Having seen all of that, now I'm going to quickly walk you through the innovation that the second paper brought. So it's basically building directly on top of the denoising uh, diffusion probabilistic models or DDPMs for short. Um, let me show you main contributions of this paper. So first of all, they have a learnable um, variance um, schedule. So this is how they are going to do it. Remember this formula, we're going to see it a bit later. So basically they predict uh, this vector uh, V and then they kind of do interpolation between uh, beta T and beta tilde T which is the uh, posterior variance and this is the uh, forward uh, process variance. Okay so that's one thing they've done here so this formula here. The second thing they've done is uh, they use this hybrid loss so L simple we saw what the one is that's when you drop the terms that depend on the time step and then we have the L VLB, which is the variational lower bound. So that's the actual uh, original loss with all of those uh, complex uh, uh, terms. Uh, and by just creating this type of uh, weighted average between those two and using this one to learn uh, the, the variance and using this one to learn the mean, uh, basically they show this is the best, uh, this was the best trade-off. So there is, a, this, there is a lot of experimentation going on here. Uh, so it's kind of a lot of hacks put on top of the DTPM uh, in order to make this uh, work. As well as DTPM itself had a bunch of hacks such as using constant variances instead of learning them, etc. Et so there is a lot of hacks going on in diffusion models, at least in these earlier papers. Uh, okay, so they say here along uh, the same line of reasoning, we also apply a stop gradient to the mu of theta output for the LVLB term, which basically translate to you only, so this component is only going to be training this uh, variance expression here. Okay, so that's one thing. Uh, so that's the second thing actually. And then the third thing is instead of using a linear, um, like basically a noise schedule, so those betas being a simple, like a linear uh, sequence, instead of that, they, they propose this cosine schedule and uh, what that brings is that you can see that uh, alpha bar theta, uh, alpha, alpha bar t, sorry, uh, basically has much less, much more gradual uh, drop compared to linear. And because of that, uh, that, that determines directly the amount of noise. And thus, if you use the linear schedule, so basically using the linear schedule will lead to noisier images earlier on in the uh, forward process of the diffusion. Okay, that's a third thing they, they do that helps a lot. And then let me show you a couple more expressions here. Uh, one very cool thing is using um, basically uh, the values of the loss uh, for each of the time step to understand how much weight we want to put on top of that time step. So this is kind of middle ground between using the simple objective where all of those constants with, with all of the LT minus ones are basically constant like n equal to, I guess, one. And then you have the LVLB, which had those complex uh, expressions. And finally, we have this uh, type of uh, important sampling where depending on the loss, so if, for example, if you're struggling with one particular image in the process, let's say this one, the ith image here, basically what you do is you increase the loss for that particular uh, xt. So you'll put additional focus on trying to predict that noise 
uh, that was put on top of this image. So that's, that's the idea with, with this uh, uh, expression here. Let me continue and we are almost done. Finally, this expression 19, not that important. Basically, what they show is that during training and during sampling, you don't have to use the same type, the same length of a diffusion process. So for example, your training chain has like 4,000 uh, images, whereas you can, during the sampling uh, time, you can just have 100 uh, images, 100 latents. And uh, uh, basically they show that uh, how to remap the betas and beta tildes uh, the posterior variance is uh, such that this uh, actually works out nicely and they get high quality images and they obviously save a lot of computation which is super important because you don't want to sample 4,000 images every time you need to generate an image. That's going to be super expensive. Okay, guys, that's pretty much it. A couple more things here and we are done with the papers. Uh, they show, and this is super interesting, they showed the scaling laws for diffusion models, and this was back, I think, in 2020. So if you if you kind of read this paper, you could have expected that they are going to do the same thing as with GPT-3, and that's to scale up these models, and that eventually led to Glide, and then the Lee, and the Lee 2. Uh, and you can see here again, we have the power law. We see, we have we see that the FID, uh, which is the metric that shows you how high quality that your samples are, you can see that with the increasing size, we keep on getting smaller and smaller FIDs. Uh, whereas with NLL, which is the negative loss likelihood, it does not exactly follow the uh, uh, power law, but it's kind of still going down here. So yeah, in any case, uh, these two charts kind of uh, are indicative that scaling up diffusion models will probably be a good, uh, uh, like a good avenue for future research. Okay. Let's see the conclusion. The likelihood is improved by learning uh, the variances using our parameterization and hybrid objective. Uh, furthermore, we have investigated how DDPM scale with the amount of available training compute and found that more training compute trivially leads to better sample quality and log likelihood. Okay, guys, so you hopefully got the gist of, of diffusion models. We saw how, how we have this forward process of noising the images, and then we have the backward, the reverse process of denoising the images. We learned that, and then plus add to that a bunch of hacks uh, to get this thing to work but ultimately they are now the best generative models we have because they have, compared to GANs, uh, they are much better at covering, covering all of the modes of your data distribution. Uh, whereas we, we know that GANs suffer from mode collapse, we also have much more, uh, like, uh, it's much more stable to train diffusion models as, as compared to, to, to GANs. So yeah, basically diffusion models are currently uh, what GANs were a couple of years ago. Cool guys, let's now switch to the code. Um, I'm gonna show you how this thing is actually trained and how we sample from the diffusion models. Uh, before that, let me just show you the architecture they're using to actually learn uh, the epsilon, so the noise uh, uh, during the diffusion model training. So this is a simple unit. This is how the architecture looks like. We're gonna see this in the code. This is less important, arguably. You could use some other architectures as well. Uh, they just kinda stuck with, with the unit. Okay. Let's start doing the training. Okay, I went on and downloaded uh, the, 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 the GitHub repo, had to create some modifications to get thing to, this thing to work on my uh, single GPU Windows machine. Um, I can kind of um, submit that to my GitHub. Uh, do, do let me know if you, if you want me to do that. If so, I can easily create a, uh, like a, um, I'll easily just push this code on, on, onto my GitHub repo. Okay. So I just created uh, this launch script. So I basically used uh, the recommended settings that they've uh, showed in their readme file here. So you can kind of take a look at the readme of the, of the repo, which we're gonna be using, the improved diffusion repo. And basically, yeah, so that's what I've set in my launch. And now we can start uh, training here. That's less important. We're gonna see what's going on here uh, in a minute. Okay, so let me start the training. Uh, we're first gonna obviously have a bunch of arguments. So here they are, I'm gonna kind of print them out, but don't try and understand what's going on. There's too many of them. We'll gradually start on analyzing what's going on. So we have uh, the Cypher dataset, which I downloaded using their Cypher uh, script. Uh, then there is like a bunch of other stuff, learning rate, uh, blah, blah, blah. We'll see all of that later. So I'm gonna kind of ignore the parts that are not crucial to understanding diffusion models, which means I'm gonna be ignoring the distributed training, I'm gonna be ignoring the loggers, all of that, uh, and I'm gonna focus only on diffusion. So here is the first important step. We basically take these arguments, 
convert them into dictionary, and we start creating the, 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 the actual uh, uh, unit model and then the diffusion uh, object here. So let's see how the model uh, is gonna be constructed. So we basically pass image size gonna be 64. Uh, usually they have lower resolutions because remember the latents are of the same uh, like dimensionality as the uh, as the X zero as the original image. Contrast that with uh, VAEs. Contrast that with GANs. With any other model, the latents are always much of of smaller dimensionality. Whereas here. Uh, it's a bit more computational intensive and so because of that uh, what they uh, end up doing in practice is training uh, models for smaller images and then training additionally super resolution models and they actually have uh, like here scripts as you can see here uh, basically uh, super res sample super res train I'm gonna uh, skip those because they, they really work very similarly to how diffusion works so I'm gonna focus on these two scripts here the image sample and the image train okay anyways number of channels um, that's gonna be internal dimension of the unit, number of res blocks, nothing interesting there. Learn sigma set to true means we are learning the variances instead of uh, hard coding them, instead of using the fixed ones. Uh, so that's the innovation from the improved diffusion paper. Uh, class conditioning, uh, so we will not be using that, but it's very easy to add class conditioning. We'll see how they use temporal conditioning. So how do we pass the T, because T is a scalar, how do we pass that into a neural network? We're gonna see they are just using simple uh, sinusoids, like simple, uh, similar embeddings as what the original transformer paper used. So, and then they can alert, I'll, sh I'll show you how they kind of fuse that into the unit model. And we would be doing the same thing with this class conditioning uh, if we were using it, which we are not at the moment, in any case. Okay. Checkpointing um, is just an optimization technique I'm, I'm gonna kinda ignore. Uh, what checkpointing does is during the forward pass, instead of storing the activations for every single layer, you don't do that. And because of that, you save a bunch of memory. But as a, on, on the con side, uh, you'll have to kinda, when you do the, the, the backprop in order to cal calculate the gradients, you'll have to do recomputations recup again. So you're trading off uh, the memory for time. So you'll spend up much more time, but you'll save up memory by doing this. We'll not be using the checkpointing, so yeah, just uh, FYI. Uh, certain layers of unit uh, have basically a VAT type of uh, attention. So that means uh, each of the token of the image is gonna be attending to each of the other the tokens, and that's what they show here. So 16 means at resolution 16 by 16, uh, they'll be uh, doing the, the this attention, and at eight by eight, resolution they'll be doing the same thing so when i say 8 by 8 it's inside of the actual unit because you, you know that unit has that characteristic shape okay so number of heads again just the parameter for that attention uh, layer inside of unit uh, nothing important there we're gonna see how this parameter is used uh, basically this is how, how we depending on this flag they'll have two different ways of combining of conditioning the uh, the, the images uh, with with the time steps so yeah we'll see how this uh, plays out a bit later okay so here is uh, the create model function uh, basically because image size is 64 they specify this is how they specify how unit will be constructed uh, then we have this attention DS. Attention DS basically converts this attention resolution into how many downsampling layers we have to wait inside of the unit before we start using these attentional layers. So just another way of specifying when do we start inserting those attention layers into our unit, okay? Not that vital, you can kind of ignore that if you didn't understand it. So input number of channels, obviously three, we're dealing with RGB images. Uh, we specified number of channels here because we are learning sigma. Because of that, this uh, uh, we end up with six output channels, and the first three channels will be predicting the epsilon, so that's the noise, and the the the, the second three uh, channels will be predicting the actual variances. So that's why we have six here. Okay, uh, number of blocks, blah blah blah, nothing special. Dropout, blah blah blah. We'll not be using class conditioning, so we end up with none here for number of classes. We're not using checkpointing. Okay, specifying details of attention, etc. Okay, let's enter the uh, constructor. I'm gonna quickly walk you through UNET. So we are start starting step by step. We'll first see how UNET works and then we're gonna see how it fits into the whole um, like uh, training loop uh, later on. Okay, so let's see here. We just store all of these parameters inside of uh, uh, like internal fields here. Uh, nothing fancy there. 
So we here we create this layer, the sequential layer, which con consists out of this um, basically inverse bottleneck uh, shape of MLP. So this is a simple MLP that's gonna be used to transform uh, the sinusoids uh, before we use them to condition uh, the model. We'll see that a bit later, okay? So we can ignore this because we're not, not using classes. And now we start adding uh, blocks uh, to form the unit. Again, we have three types of blocks. We have the input blocks, then we have uh, the middle blocks here, and finally we have the output blocks. So that corresponds to what we saw in this diagram here, basically, whoops, uh, my one note is glitching, so you can see it here. So we have, we kind of have the first part here, the input blocks, then we have the middle blocks, and then we have the output blocks here. That's roughly how, how, how this code is structured. So let me now get back to it. And let me quickly walk you through. There is, I'm not gonna dig into the actual details. There is a couple important things I wanna show you how they fuse the temporal information with the image information. That's the vital thing I wanna show you here. Okay, so there's this um, wrapper object called time step embed sequential. Uh, we're gonna see that a lot. What it does basically is the following, uh, depending if the layer inherits from this time step block, which is just a simple interface, a dummy interface that where, where the 4.0 function supports both, both the X, which is the image representation, and the embedding, the temporal embeddings. Uh, in, in that case, uh, we'll, be pa we'll be calling the layer passing both arguments, uh, whereas if, if it's not inheriting from time step block, then we'll just be passing X and ignoring uh, uh, like the embeddings. So as I said, a simple wrapper, nothing too interesting. Uh, okay, so the first thing we do is we create this uh, COM2D layer. Why COM2D? Because this is COM and D, a generic layer they created, and then number of dimensions is two, and because of that, we end up with a uh, COM2D. So that's how the unit model starts. Uh, next up, uh, let me show you what is going on here. So we have channel multiplication. We're gonna iterate through this uh, array. And then this is the interesting part. We start adding residual blocks. So the interesting part about residual blocks is um, actually only the forward function. And I'll, I'm, I'm gonna put a breakpoint here. And later on, I'm gonna show you how this uh, temporal fusion is, uh, is happening. But for the time being, let me quickly step through the constructor of the, of the, of the resonant block just quickly. Uh, so we just stored the number of channels. Uh, the, the, the number of uh, channels for, for the um, basically uh, temporal vectors, blah, 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 um, nothing fancy here. Let me see whether there is something interesting I need to focus on here. So we have, we specify these input layers, we specify the embedding layers. We'll see how these are used a bit later, so bear with me here. Uh, and we finally have out layers, normalization, blah, blah, blah. Cilu is just activation unit. There is like a zillion of these activation units and uh, it's not even worth mentioning. Uh, okay, so basically all of the fun will happen later on during the forward, pro forward prop. And I'm, that's when I'm gonna kind of step into the Resna block and show you how the, how the uh, temporal information is mixed into the uh, network. Okay, so after that, Sometimes we'll be adding, as, as I said here, so if this thing is, uh, if we are, if, if we downsampled four times, then we're gonna add the attention block, which we haven't at this step. So we're gonna skip this part for now. And then we add, as you can see here, two input blocks, we just add uh, the layers, which we accumulated dur during the loop. And we just wrap it up into this time step embed sequential, which is again, that useful wrapper we saw a couple minutes ago. That's it guys, uh, nothing fancy there. Uh, so I'm gonna kind of skip to mid layer here. Uh, okay, let me ignore this thing here. So here we are. Um, this middle block consists of a res block, uh, attention block and an additional res block. I can skip all of that. Let's continue here. And finally, the output blocks are literally what, what we just saw in the input blocks. Uh, so it's the same pretty much uh, list of objects and here you can see by doing this we are reversing um, and we're creating a symmetric uh, construction for the output blocks. Okay, so because of that I'm just going to skip all of this and, and end up here. And here we add the normalization layer, which is I think group normalization, but again, not that important to understand. And finally we end up with a conv layer and this zero module just zeroes out the weights uh, of these kernels. I'm not sure why they're doing that. Uh, if anyone knows that, feel free to comment down below. Why do they initialize 
some of the layers with all zero weights, I'm not completely sure. Cool, again, main takeaway from the, from the unit model is um, like it has this very interesting type of a shape uh, and with the input blocks, middle blocks and output blocks. And the most important thing I want you to remember here is they have this part where they are mixing in the temporal information. We're gonna see that a bit later, but just keep that in mind for now. Okay, that was the creation of the model. We do the same thing for diffusion. So we have, uh, like I've set 50 steps, it was 4,000 by default. Uh, this is just so that I can train a bit quicker on my machine. Uh, otherwise it's very slow to, to actually train this. Uh, okay, so we have learn sigma, nothing special there. Noise schedule is gonna be linear. So the betas for the forward process are gonna be uh, basically sampled uh, as a, we sample the linear function instead of the cosine. We don't use the KL. Uh, basically this, if we were to set this to true, we'd be using the variational lower bound loss. Instead of this, we're gonna be using the hybrid loss. So we'll see all of that a bit later. We are not predicting the X start. X start is just the starting image, the original image from your data set. Uh, and we will be um, basically rescaling time step. All of this is not that important. We'll see what those parameters are uh, a bit later, but they're not that interesting. Okay, so here we have, uh, we, we first form the, the, the beta schedule. So we pass the um, like name of the schedule and number of steps, and this just returns uh, those betas we saw uh, in the paper in the beginning of the video. So let me quickly show you uh, the two uh, like schedules they support. One is linear layer, as mentioned, it's just a simple in space between the, fr the beta start, bet beta end, and we linearly interpolate uh, using the number of diffusion steps here. For the, for the cosine schedule, you have this a bit more complex expression where you create those, um, we saw the, these equations in the paper. I'm gonna kinda ignore those for now, not that important. Okay, so let's see which loss we pick. We are gonna use something called rescaled MSC, uh, mean squared error. Uh, that's because we are using the um, hybrid loss. We'll see how that plays out a bit later. Uh, times steps respacing again this is important only when you want to reduce the number of steps during the sampling uh, process which we will not be using so uh, we can kind of ignore all of that uh, again this is the function that does that type of a logic uh, and uh, basically for our case we can skip this because we end up with let me let me show you how this all steps look like it's basically just MP arrange so you end up with as you can see here 0 through 49 because we have 50 steps and so there is nothing, no uh, like subsampling that we'll be doing in this training. Okay, we pass the betas. Uh, we'll be uh, model mean type is going to be epsilon. So we'll be, we'll be predicting epsilon instead of predicting uh, x start. So in some of the ablations, they actually tried predicting the x start, which means the original image. So instead of trying to predict the noise that that the uh, that was added on top of the original image, why not? try and predict the original image. But empirically they showed that it's better to predict the epsilon, okay? Uh, let's continue. So what's the model variance type? So because uh, this is set to true, uh, that means we'll be using the learned uh, range. So we'll be learning the, the variances. Uh, loss type is as we saw, rescaled MSC, and that's pretty much it. Now let's step into the space diffusion. Uh, basically, the important piece here is the construction of this Gaussian diffusion object. So let's see how that thing is gonna look like. So that's the Gaussian diffusion class. Uh, that's important. That, that, this is the file where all of the magic will happen. Basically this Gaussian diffusion.py, that's the most important file in this whole code base. So again, we specify the mean, it's gonna be the uh, epsilon, the variance, which is gonna be learned, and then the loss type, rescaled MSC, blah, blah, blah. And next up, we, we form the, the, we just basically convert betas into NumPy array. Uh, we do some error checking, assert, asserting that that's just a, like a 1D array, and that all of the betas are bigger than zero, and smaller or equal than one, that's all. We grab the number of steps here. And here we start creating those equations we saw, the coefficients, not the equations we saw in the paper. Now for these formulas, I'm just gonna put things side by side so it's gonna be easier for you to understand what's going on. Okay, let's start. So here are the alphas. The alphas, uh, we saw those coefficients here, basically one minus betas. That's how we form the alphas. And then we have alpha bars, which is just the products uh, of alphas. And you can see how we form those alphas. It's called com prod, like a cumulative product. Uh, we basically just call this MP com prod and we end up with array. So this thing is still gonna be 50. 
uh, the length of this thing is going to be, as you can see here, it's going to be 50. That means that by indexing into this array, we end up with a, a, like a basically, um, a, well, we basically specify T of this product. So it's not like we just calculated um, the whole product of all of the uh, alphas. We, we actually have, uh, well, we, we actually have the array that contains alpha T bars for all of the T's, which means uh, zero through 49. Okay, next up we have this, this, this parameter uh, called, this coefficient called alphas uh, uh, comprod pref. Like basically what we do here is we, uh, what? We do the uh, right shifting. So we add one as the first element, and then we take uh, the, the first uh, n minus one elements and, and pre, like uh, append them to this list. And we also have this uh, comprod next. So where those are used is, let me just see, I'm fairly sure it's gonna be used for this uh, mean, yeah, it's gonna be used for the posterior. So it's basically used for this uh, posterior uh, like forward process. So the, for the mean and for the, um, as you can see here, for the, for the variance, okay? So we're gonna see how we construct those uh, in a second. So we, we now construct square root of alpha's comprod. So those are gonna be used as you can see here. So this, uh, let, let me kind of uh, change the color here. And you can see this is now the term we constructed here. Uh, then we create square root one minus alpha scum prod, which is gonna be, uh, let's see whether we have that one somewhere here. I don't think so, but like, yeah. Um, it's gonna be used somewhere later on, okay? Uh, we do the same thing for log, uh, square root, blah, blah, blah. Uh, there is a lot of these. So this is square root uh, re reciprocal alpha scum prod. So that's square root of one over this. Okay, so the square root, uh, so this expression here is actually used for the uh, component in the loss here. You can see it here. Uh, as I said, for each of these we'll have, uh, we'll basically calculate all of the coefficients. We have the posterior variance, which is again, uh, this expression here. Let me just kind of, uh, let me show you that this is indeed the case. So we have betas, here are the betas. We have one minus alpha scomprod pref. So that's this expression here. So that's the numerator of our expression here. And then we have the denominator, which is one minus um, alpha scomprod. So that's it, as I said, they are now literally going through formulas in this paper and calculating all of the necessary coefficients. We do the same thing here and then we have this, uh, I'm gonna show you quickly these two. So we have the posterior mean coefficient. Basically it's uh, equal to um, betas, as you can see here, and then times square root alphas comprod pref. So that's this one, square root of alphas previous uh, n bar. Okay, and then we divide that by one minus uh, this expression here. So hopefully I, this this convinced you that uh, indeed they're just going on here and calculating all of these coefficients and that's pretty much it. I'm gonna go back into the full screen here and continue with the code. Okay, so uh, this is again not interesting because this is only vital in the case of we doing a subsampling uh, during sampling, which we will not be doing, I using less steps during the sampling procedure, which we will not be using. So I can kind of safely ignore all of this. And finally, uh, they use uh, those betas to construct the uh, uh, this Gaussian diffusion model. So this one was just used for, for this process here. For all practical purposes, this init function here is gonna construct the same Gaussian object we just saw. So I'm gonna skip, I'm gonna skip everything here. And so that's, that's it. We end up with a Gaussian diffusion object. Okay guys, so we have UNET. We saw how they literally go formula by formula and compute all of that uh, inside of the constructor of the Gaussian diffusion object. Now let's go on further here. Let's exit all these functions. We are back to our main function. What they do is they just push the model to GPU in, ca in case you have GPU. Uh, they just now uh, create this schedule sampler. So this one is fairly interesting. I'm gonna show you how this one looks like. It basically um, specifies how do we want during the training sample, uh, so which steps, i.e. which loss components, those LT minus ones, do we wanna uh, train? And so 
what they use by default is just a uniform sample, which means all of the steps are equally likely. But then they also have that other sample, which I did mention, where depending on the loss of particular LT minus one, they'll maybe increase, like upscale that weight so that we focus more on uh, basically, yeah, learning that particular uh, part of the diffusion process. Okay, let me just kind of go through, through here. So here is the uniform sampler, uh, basically, here is how that sampler looks like. So the weights of the uniform sampler are obviously all ones. So we have number of steps, so we have like 50 ones. And then during the sampling, what happens is this sample function is called because as you can see here, uniform sampler uh, inherits from schedule sampler, this object here. And here's what happens. So we have weights. So this is all ones and then we divide here. So we normalize and actually have a probability distribution because the sum needs to be equal to one, as you know. Uh, and then we just call MP random choice. So we basically do, uh, this is how we weight all of the uh, 50 uh, time steps and we just uh, basically sample uh, whatever the batch size is uh, of, those, of those time steps. So that's what's gonna happen and then some conversion here, uh, nothing fancy. <clears throat> so the interesting sampler is that second one which I'll just kind of briefly show you but I will not go into it maybe later if we have enough time. So last second moment resampler. So this is the one where they basically use the loss history to uh, decide on how, so you can see here, depending on the loss, you'll have bigger weights for, for those components where the loss is bigger. So that's roughly it, but we'll not be using this one. So I'm gonna kind of skip it for the, for the sake of time. Okay, let's continue here. We have our uh, uniform sampler. Uh, we now create uh, the data set. So basically I'll be just using Cypher. That doesn't need to be the case. They also used ImageNet 64 by 64 in the paper and you can use whatever data set you want. Uh, and that's it. Now we have the training loop. This is where the actual training is gonna happen. We pass in the model, We put, like that's the UNet, we pass in the diffusion um, model on top of it. We feed in the data, uh, batch size, micro batch. So this is gonna be, um, like uh, we're gonna be chunking the actual batch into micro batches because we, like as I said, this is fairly memory intensive. That's why they have all of these uh, optimization methods such as checkpointing and micro batching to kind of cope with all of that uh, excess memory, okay? EMA, so that's your exponential moving average because uh, they'll actually be using, um, uh, so EMA type of weights for, for sampling later on. Nothing fancy here, logging, saving, resuming, checkpointing, blah, 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 FP16. We don't care about mixed precision training. I just wanna focus on diffusion. Uh, we pass in our uniform sampler, blah, 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 some optimization details like weight decay for the atom W. Okay, we can enter this uh, train loop. Let's see what's going on here. So we pass in all of these, we kind of store them into the internal fields. Okay, um, we have all of this. I'm gonna kind of skip through all of this, nothing interesting. Okay, we have our model parameters. We have the master parameters. Again, this is a uh, like a consequence of the training this in a distributed fashion across multiple machines. So we, for our, like, for all practical purposes, we don't care about the, the, this. We just have a single set of parameters. Okay, syncing again, a consequence of, of uh, distributed training. We don't care about it. They create the Adam W optimizer. Okay, uh, now they have for each of the EMA uh, rates specified, uh, they create uh, like a deep copy of the parameters. So because we only have uh, one EMA rate, we'll basically just have a single um, like copy of the parameters. Again, not that important for you to understand. Let's go on here. This is distributed uh, data parallel wrapper in PyTorch. Again, we'll not be using that. So for all practical purposes, we can ignore it. Let's jump into the actual meat of the code, of the training code. So we first go on to sample a single batch of images and potentially the, class, the classes that correspond to those images. Uh, let me quickly walk you through how this low data looks like. Basically, uh, this is gonna collect all of the um, images, all of the paths from my uh, data set. So, so I did go on and kind of download those as I told you, so you can see them here. And if I kind of step over that, uh, it's gonna collect all of my images. And um, let me now show you how it looks like. Whoops, if I copy paste the all files and I print the first, let's say two paths, you can see 006 PNG and 13 PNG, and those are exactly 
those are exactly these two first images here. So here is that one. Well, it's super small, so you will not see the cipher after all. Okay. Um, okay, then they go on to form this uh, image data set uh, where just they just do some uh, resizing, cropping, but nothing too interesting. And here we have the data uh, loader with batch sizes of 128. And we finally yield the batch from our data set. Okay. That ends up giving us uh, a batch of size. I guess it's going to be, uh, I expect it's going to be 128, uh, 364, 64, because it's Cypher, it's RBG, RGB images, and 128 is the batch size. So let's see whether that's the case. Uh, it, indeed, it is the case. And conditioning, we don't have anything, so it's going to be just empty dictionary, as you can see here. Okay, cool. So here's the first step. Let's now. This is the. This is where all of the magic happens. I'm going to ignore everything afterwards because it's just kind of. It's just your common machine learning boilerplate code. So I'm going to ignore all of that. So we have a forward, forward, backward call here. Okay. So we just use zero gradients uh, of our unit. We want to clean those gradients before we recompute them again and then do the update. Okay. So here we load the first micro batch. So you can see we just subsample this batch and we end up with like 2, 3, 64, 64 because our micro batch dimension is 2. And we do the same thing for conditioning, which because it's an empty dictionary, we don't really care. We just check whether this is a last batch, which it's not because we just started the loop. And uh, now this is uh, where we do the uniform sampling of the diffusion process. Okay, so this is this is the idea. We we now s s uh, sample uh, t's, so the time steps for each of the images in our batch. Okay, so let's do that. So we 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 do that, and we end up with two random t's, so 44 and 3. So that means we'll take the first image, we'll basically add noise 44 times. In practice, we'll just have a single step because of that nice property we saw in the paper, and we'll get there. And then this second one just ha has three steps of noise. And then we try and predict back the noise. So that's going to be the goal. Okay. So this is the main function in this uh, training code. This training losses function, we'll see it in a moment. We just kind of wrap it up using the function func tools partial so that we don't have to pass these parameters every single time. So just kind of convenience wrapper there. And again, we just, you can ignore all of this because that's just distributed code, nothing interesting. Let's focus on the compute losses. This is the most important function here. Okay, so what's going on? First of all, we generate noise that has the same shape as our input image, uh, our input micro batch. So because X star is again, two, three, 64, 64, we're gonna end up with basically normal Gaussian tensor of the same shape. Okay, so that's again, our noise. Uh, of the same shape as the input images. And then we do the Q sample. So let me remind you what that thing is. Okay, so here's the formula that are, we are going to use. Uh, we are basically gonna do this computation here. Actually, this computation I showed you here. So let's see that that's indeed the case. So let me just kinda see where I have a breakpoint here. I do have a breakpoint. So here we are, we are in, the, in that function. You can see that uh, this is everything we do. So we have this extract into tensor, we'll see what that does. But we have this square root alpha scum prod, which is this part here. Let me just change the color. So, okay, so we have this part here. And then we multiply that element wise with x start, which is x zero, which is this thing here. Okay. And then we add a square root one minus alpha scum prod, which is this part here. We add up this and we multiply it with, with noise, as you can see here. So we literally are just computing formulas from the paper, nothing fancy there. Okay, now I'm gonna one time just show you how this uh, extract into tensor function looks like uh, for the sake of your, uh, I guess, understanding of the code. So I'm gonna kind of add a breakpoint there. So what we do is the following. So we uh, take that, um, so the, the array we have, like the, let's say, let's say the alpha T bar or whatnot, and we basically just extract using the time steps. So time steps are, if you recall, like we had, um, whoops, 
times steps, we end up with 44.3. So we're gonna end up taking the alpha 44 bar, and we're gonna end up taking the alpha 3 bar, which are gonna con uh, contain uh, respectively 44 uh, terms, uh, the product of 44 terms and the product of three terms. And then the only thing we do is literally, we add these dummy dimensions uh, as many times as possible so that we have the same dimensionality as the image we are doing element-wise multiplication with. And then we just expand here uh, the, the vector. So we, we, we just wanna have the same shape of this, of this uh, yeah. So why are we doing this? Well, because we cannot multiply a scalar with a tensor. And because of that, we're just basically just copy pasting and broadcasting this, this scalar. So we end up with a tensor that contains, whose all elements contain this particular alpha 44 bar or whatnot. Okay, hopefully that was clear enough. Uh, now I'm gonna kind of, uh, let me first uh, ignore this. I'm gonna not, will not be stepping into this function anymore. And that's it. That's it guys, we have, we have the XT. So we have our noisy version of the image right here. Okay, let's see what the next steps are. First of all, uh, because our loss is uh, gonna be hybrid, we're gonna ignore this part. And we'll see that we'll, we'll actually be computing the same thing a bit later down below because hybrid also contains this variational lower bound loss as well. Okay, so here we are, we have the, our loss type is if you recall, rescaled MSC and we end up now here. So this step is supposed to output the epsilon, so we need to learn to predict the noise that, if you recall, uh, we basically took that noise and we now, we basically, using that noise, we formed the XTs. Now we're trying to predict, especially, like particularly this noise. So this is the term we'll be trying to learn how to predict. Those are the green dots I showed you in the one-on paper. So this, that's gonna be the first three channels. The, the last three channels are gonna be about the variance, and we'll see those, uh, uh, in, a, in a bit, uh, but for now, let me show you how this uh, forward prop is gonna work. So this is again, unit. We're gonna do something to the time steps. So we're gonna somehow merge them into this uh, together with this, uh, with the image representation. And let me quickly show you why we are doing this. Why are we passing X and T? So this is the particular expression we are now dealing with. Here we have our unit. So this epsilon T in practice. So let me again change the color. So this thing here is our unit. We have this expression is the xt. So that's the thing we just calculated. So that's the xt, again, xt. And we also pass t, which are the time steps. And that's why we have this particular expression. That's why we are computing by executing this line of code here. Okay, let me, let me go back here and let me step uh, through this particular thingy. Uh, we can ignore this rep model. Um, basically, it serves the purpose of, again, only if you have the, the subsampling during the, 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 your sampling procedure, which we'll not be doing, so none of this really matters. And then we do some rescaling, nothing that's super interesting, just some legacy stuff so that they are comparable with the DDPM original paper, etc. So here is the actual UNET forward pass. So we have the new TS, so this is just gonna, some rescaled versions, uh, but still scalars of our original 44 and three, if you recall uh, these uh, time steps here. And now let's let's pass that, and this is just empty. Like the, the key uh, word arguments are just empty. We don't have anything there. So we just pass the time steps and we pass the images. So let me show you the shape here. Shape here is again, two, three, 64, 64. Okay. Now let's step through the forward pass of the uh, UNET model. Here is where the magic happens. First of all, we have this time step embedding, which is going to map the scalars into certain uh, vectors, which are just like heuristics. Basically, we're just using some sinusoids. Same thing as in the original transformer paper. So let's see how that looks like, okay? So here it is. Again, not gonna dig into the details. You can see a bunch of sinusoids, co cosines. What ultimately matters is that we end up Instead of with scalars, we end up with 228. So we end up with two vectors. So now we can we can kind of work with vectors in neural networks. It's kind of hard to work with scalars. Uh, after that, okay, 
I stepped into something, uh, whatever. Okay, so now we have this, it was actually the, the, the activation function of this time embed. And if you recall, time embed is this inverse bottleneck uh, of, a, of, a, of a MLP. So let me just find that thing quickly. So time embed, where are you? Here it is. It's just a combination of two linear layers, uh, whereas the, this uh, innermost uh, like layer has 4x the uh, dimensionality of the input and output layers. Hence, I call it inverse bottleneck. And this is just like this times four is stuck with us since 2017, the original paper, people just keep using that. Again, just a simple transformation and we end up with some, we'll end up with some uh, vector of different dimensionality. So let me show you that. Let's kind of step over here. We end up with what? We end up embedding vector here being two, five, 12. Okay, so that's it. That's our time information. Now let's, let's insert that time information somehow. So we go through the input blocks. Remember the first block is gonna be like the comp layer and then we're gonna have the res blocks. So let's see the, the, the first thing. So the first thing, nothing, nothing super interesting because it's just a comp layer. Uh, but if I have, hopefully I've added a breakpoint to do res block, let's just find the res block here. Uh, where are you? Okay, here it is. Here is the residual block. Here is where the magic of, of merging happens. Let me show you this. So, okay, here we are. We do some processing on the image. That's not that important. So these in layers are just like uh, normalization, some convolutions, whatnot, uh, nothing interesting there. Next up, we take our embedding vectors, which are again, two, five, 12, right? So that's gonna be two, five, 12. And we pass them to the embed layers. So let's see what those are. Again, that's just like a linear layer uh, that does some additional processing on top of those representations, nothing super vital. Let me show you the shape. Okay, 2256. And now what we do is we just add the dim dummy dimensions until we have the same shape as this, as, as these image features H. So H has the shape of, as you can see, 2, 128, 64, 64. Because of that, we're gonna keep on adding dummy dimensions to, to our temporal tensor until we end up with the same uh, number of, of dimensions you can see here and now because these two are one one we'll basically be broadcasting those so copy pasting the temporal vectors before we combine them with the image features so here's where the magic happens so this is the parameter we saw before the boolean u scale shift norm that's one option how we can do it you can just also just simply add you can simply add the temporal information to the image features and that's how you can uh, condition the, the model okay but they, I guess, empirically uh, found out that this uh, approach works a bit better. Instead of just adding up the temporal representations to the image features, instead of that, let's kind of chunk this. So we start with 2, 256, 1, 1. By doing this chunking uh, along the first dimension, that means we're gonna split this 256 into 128. Okay, so let me kind of step over there. Let me show you the scale and shift are gonna be 2, 128, 1, 1, right? The same thing for shift. And then this is how they kind of combine the image features with the temporal features. One plus scale, and then we add a shift. And we just have some normalization for the image features beforehand, and then we do some um, additional processing. That's it, guys. That's everything there is to, to, to how this unit works. I think this is like everything you really need to know. I'm gonna uh, remove that breakpoint and continue on here. Uh, and that's pretty much it. And now we're gonna keep on doing this input blocks, middle blocks, output blocks. We're gonna keep on adding and merging the, the temporal information and that's it. I'm gonna just skip over all of this. <clears throat> okay, so we've done the 40 prop. Uh, here we are, we are exiting the, uh, the function. So we end up with, let's see, the shape should be, as I said, we should have, I guess, um, 2, 6, 64, 64. That's the prediction. Let's see whether that's indeed the case. So 2, 6, 64, 64 indeed. Why is that? Well, because basically um, uh, we, we, we have six channels because the first three channels again are epsilon, which are the noise, which we're trying to predict. And the next three channels are the variance. So let's see how that's gonna be used here um, later on. So because we have a uh, learned range, we're gonna enter this part of the uh, this branch here. 
uh, we just extract some dimensions. So XT is again, that's our tensor uh, of noise images, 2, 3, 64, 64. So we're gonna split the output uh, into two groups, each of with three channels. That's what I just explained. So model output is gonna ha have the epsilon, so that's gonna contain the noise, whereas this is gonna contain the variance. And let me now show you the shapes. Basically, it's gonna be two, three, 64, 64, whereas previously we had two, six, 64, 64. Okay. Now what we do here is uh, basically we take the epsilon, we detach it from the computational PyTorch graph, which means we'll not be updating uh, the, 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 the epsilon, whereas we pass the variance like this. And why is that? Well, if you recall from the paper, and I'll show you that in a second as well, we basically just, uh, in the hybrid loss, we use the, um, this variational uh, bound uh, loss to train the variances, whereas we use the simplified uh, loss objective to train the mean, uh, or in this case, to train the epsilon, which is equivalent because we have that different uh, representations, parameterizations. So let me show you again the paper and compare this side by side. Okay, so here it is. Basically, as I mentioned, we have the hybrid loss consists out of uh, simple and elevated, uh, so the variational lower bound objective, and they, they mentioned here, Along the same line of reasoning, we also apply a stop gradient to the mu of theta, or equivalently to the epsilon theta, output for the LVLB term. So that means this term is gonna, we're gonna freeze, we're gonna detach from the computational graph. That's why we are doing this, this part here, okay? Now let's go on and compute the actual uh, LVLB terms. So we are now computing literally this. We're computing this thing here, right? That's what we are currently doing. And later, you'll see in a couple of seconds, we'll be computing the L simple. Again, just executing the formulas from the paper, that's it. Do let me know whether this side-by-side -side comparison between formulas and code helps you or not, because these videos are super long and take me a lot of time to, to create them. So any feedback is very much appreciated. Continuing on here, we do that, we concatenate those two. And then we call, call this uh, VB terms BBD. So let me just kind of uh, see where I have a breakpoint there. Yes, I do. Um, let's go back to the code. Okay. So what we do here is we pass this dummy model. Why dummy? Because the, this function here will later be calling this model, but it, we will not actually be doing a for prop through the unit. Uh, as you can see, this is how we define the model. You basically see this is just a like a dummy lambda function that just returns. Uh, so no matter what you pass in, it's just going to return R, which is the frozen out, which is this thing here. So we'll see some model, like we'll see a forward prop, but it's not gonna be a forward prop, it's just gonna be this dummy return of, of what we already computed. Just keep that in mind. Okay, so what we pass, we pass the X start, which are the original images. We pass the XT, which are the images that were noised uh, using uh, like T number of steps, which we have here. And now let's kind of step into this uh, function and see how it's computed. So what we do is we compute the um, posterior mean and variance here. By doing that, we basically compute the, um, the forward process posterior, and we're going to basically do a KL divergence, as you can see here, between that and between our learned reverse process. Again, let me show you the paper to make this a bit more concrete, and then we're gonna dig into the code. Okay, guys, so here is the expression we are calculating. It's nothing more than this. So we have the, as I said, posterior, here it is, like of the, of the uh, forward process. That's this thing here. Here we have the learned reverse process. So this thing here corresponds to this lines here. The Q part, the posterior of the, of the forward process corresponds to this line here, Q posterior mean variance. And then we have the KL divergence, which is just this part here. Again, this is just this part here, KL of those two distributions. And those are the LT minus one terms. So the variational lower bound terms. That's it, nothing, nothing too fancy. Now let's kind of dig and see how that's going to be computed. So we pass the X start, X T and T, which are the original image, noise image and uh, T, uh, the time steps. So let me kind of start, uh, enter this function. Again, so it even says here what it's computing. You can see here. 
So it's very nice to add this type of comments that helps a lot, to be honest. So here it is. Uh, how we compute this is we take this mean coefficient one, we multiply it with x start, we take the mean coefficient two, we multiply it with xt, and that's it. We end up with a posterior mean. Again, let me show you this side by side with the paper. Here it is, guys. So we saw this already, actually. So we have, again, posterior mean coefficient one is just this thing here. So we actually computed that, if you recall, in the constructor of the, diff the Gaussian diffusion uh, object. So this is the, the, the first coefficient here. Then we multiply that with x0, as you can see here, x start, just a different notation. And then we have posterior mean coefficient two. So that's this part here. And we multiply with xt. So that's this part here. So that's it. That's how this formula corresponds to this line here. Let me now continue here. Let me step over all of this. We end up with the posterior mean. We do the same thing with a posterior uh, variance. So that's just uh, those betas. Again, here are those betas. That's what we just computed here. That's the posterior variance and the uh, posterior log variance. Uh, I'm not sure how this one is gonna be used. We'll see that a bit later, hopefully, or maybe not. Okay, just some assertions, and that's it. We computed uh, the uh, basically this distribution. We Because it's a Gaussian, we can just return the mean and the variance, and that's it. That's perfectly des describing the Gaussian. Okay, now we do the P mean variance. So we're now doing um, that other step. So again, that's, that's this part here. This is what we're trying to compute at the moment here. Let's see how that's gonna look like. Uh, let me see whether I have a breakpoint inside of here. Yes, I do. So we passed, uh, again, model. Remember here, model is just a uh, dummy. It's just gonna return what we already computed beforehand. So the epsilon and the variances. And we pass in xt and t. So that's the, the noise image and uh, time steps. Okay, let's enter here. Again, uh, it says here, we are basically computing this. We are computing the um, p mean variance. Okay, so let me step over this. Nothing fancy there. Again, uh, this does nothing. This just returns. This just returns. We're gonna see how we are not going to enter the four function. We're just gonna return here. Okay, so we just end up with the uh, tensor we already previously computed. So it's two six sixty four sixty four. Let's see how how this is gonna be computed. So because we are actually our model var type so we are we have the we, as i said we are we are learning the variances that's why we enter this branch here we split the model output again into the epsilon and variances and now because we are um learned range and not learned we enter the else branch and as you can see here we're now calculating equation 15 from the improved ddpm so uh, paper okay let me show you that side by side okay so here it is guys uh, here is what we are computing this equation 15 so when i said we have variance i was kind of lying because that's not the case that's just a component that when you combine it like this then you end up with the variance okay so let me let me show you what they do here let me kind of remove this uh panel here uh okay so they have the mean log so they have the posterior log variance clipped so that's gonna be this part here so that's where the log part comes into play so this is the the part that they compute here it's just the mean log and then they compute the max log which is this part here actually because this is betas it's why it's the other way around but okay it doesn't matter that much you, you get the point uh finally we have this um, just normalization of the output. The output is minus one, one. They add plus one, so that's zero, two, and then divide, dividing by two, we bring it into the zero, one uh, range, I guess. And then we just do literally this equation here. So you can see V times this plus this, blah, blah, blah. Same equation. So this line is literally this equation here. And then we just add the additionally this exponent part, so that's this part, and we've successfully computed equation 15. Okay, let's continue on here. This is just some clipping, we can ignore it for now. Let me zoom in here. Uh, we are not predicting previous x, we are predicting epsilon, that's why we enter here. And we enter this branch. So, we first want to predict the, the, the x start, uh, given the um, epsilon, so the noise, given the currently noisy images and time step, we wanna predict the x zero, 
Uh, we'll see why we're using that in a second. So let me kind of step into this and show you this part. So here we are, we're predicting X star from epsilon. Uh, here is how we do that. Uh, let me again have the equation on the side so we'll be able to understand what's going on here. Okay guys, this is the equation we are computing. So re recall that XT is computed like this. If we just rearrange the terms and we compute X zero, X zero turns out to be this expression here. And that's what we are currently computing here, okay? So here are the square root reciprocal alpha scum prod. So that's literally this, square root blah, 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 this thing here. Then we multiply that with xt. You can see xt here. Then we have minus uh, square root reciprocal minus alpha blah, blah, blah. So that's literally this term here. You can just read it kind of word by word and understand that that's this term here. And we multiply that by epsilon and that's it. So that's how we calculate dx0 or x start. Uh, let's go back here. And now we're going to use that to find the model mean. And by model mean, I literally mean this expression here. No pun intended. So this expression here. Okay. So let's see how this is going to work. Uh, posterior mean variance. Uh, I think this is, well, yeah, this is the expression we already saw. Uh, we already kind of computed this thing here before. Let me kind of zoom in. Uh, so I can kind of skip through this. Yeah, I'm going to skip through this part here. We're going to ignore this because we already saw it. And that's it. We end up with our uh, mean. And that's what we return back. We return back the mean, the variance, the log variance and the predicted. So the x start. And after that, we just here pass the true mean, true log variance. So that's the, the, the ground truth. And we want to minimize the scale divergence. So we want to basically be as close as possible to that distribution. We pass our mean log variance, we calculate the KL, do some normalization, blah, blah, blah. Okay, finally, there is this step, this is L0. So in case that the time step was zero, we do some different computation, if you recall from the variational lower bound uh, loss. Uh, let me show you that side by side. Okay, guys, so here it is. So here are the LT minus ones we were computing. So those are the KL divergence. We here compute this expression, minus log P uh, data uh, X zero condition like X one. So that's what we compute here, the discretized Gaussian likelihood, blah, blah, blah. That's how we get the negative log likelihood, decoder the negative log likelihood. And that's pretty much it. And now we uh, compute depending on whether the, as I said, depending on whether T equals zero, if it's equal zero, then we have decoder NL, that's what we use as the loss. Otherwise, we use KL. Fairly simple. Fair enough. Okay, let me kind of zoom in here. And that's it. We have our first term, that's the VB, the variational lower bound term. And we just do some rescaling. That's why the loss is called rescaled MSC. Let's continue. I'm going to ignore this part here, uh, because we'll be extracting epsilon, which is noise. So we can kind of ignore everything else here. So let me just uh, make sure this doesn't have any, yeah, doesn't have any breakpoint. So we can kind of step over this. We end up with target is just going to be the noise. Uh, and here we just do MSC between the model output, which are the epsilons that we predicted from the unit. And we just do MSC here between that and the target, which is the noise. And that noise, let me see whether I can find it, whether it's in this function. Okay. And this is the noise that we initially created here before we even started creating these XTs. That's it. It's fairly actually simple. Um, to be super frank here, it's not easy to understand why this exactly works. It's kind of still magical to me, but I'm, I'm slowly learning about these diffusion models more and more. Uh, I think the first time I kind of took some time to understand these was when I was preparing the glide paper. So again, do check out that paper. I do have some short introduction, maybe even better than the one I made in this video. Uh, when it comes to understanding diffusion models. But in any case, uh, finally, because we have the hybrid uh, loss, we just combine the MSC and the variational lower bound loss. And that's it. That's our loss. After this, we just do the um, uh, like b basically do some weighting. Uh, and for each of the time steps. Uh, and because we use uniform sampling, we'll just have ones everywhere. Uh, do some logging, blah, blah, blah. And finally, we do the computation of the gradients by calling the backward function on our hybrid loss here. So 
that's pretty much it. Next up, we just keep on repeating micro batches, blah, blah, blah. Uh, I'm gonna kind of stop here. This is everything you need to know to understand how the, how the training procedure works. Hopefully that was useful. Now let's quickly dig into the sampling code and then we are done. So uh, I'm gonna stop this training here. I'm gonna enter the sampling script. So that's gonna be, let me find it here. So it's gonna be the image sample function here, the script here. Uh, and let's start uh, with the main. So I'm gonna now start and run this one. I'm gonna set the sample configuration for my launch pie in VS Code. By the way, I love VS Code. He has beautiful design, uh, amazing debugging experience. And I mean, I don't know why you would use anything else unless you don't have a choice. I guess that's, that's a reasonable uh, excuse, I guess. Okay, let's step over this. Again, bunch of arguments. Uh, we're gonna ignore distribution, blah, uh, distributional uh, training, uh, logging. Um, so I'll skip the model creation as well. So I'm just gonna disable all of the breakpoints and I'm gonna step over all of this because we already saw all of that, so I'm gonna ignore it. Now we'll load the actual model. They do provide the checkpoints uh, on their, in their GitHub repo, so do, do, do check it out. Uh, you can download it and then just set it here. Uh, so I, I kind of have it stored somewhere. So it's an ImageNet 6464 unconditional model trained on 100 million steps, I guess. Um, so we load it, we put it onto to GPU, we set it into eval mode. Uh, and we now start creating the samples, okay? So because this is not a class conditional model, we can ignore all of this part. And now this is where the magic happens. The sample function. First of all, there is this paper called DDIM. I might cover this in the next uh, video, but for now we're just gonna ignore it because this is false. We're gonna be using the P sample loop, this function here. That's the one we're gonna be using, not the DDIM. Uh, it turns out that DDIM in a nutshell works better when you only have 50 or less time steps during your sampling procedure. As soon as you pass the, the 50 threshold roughly, then this method here uh, operates better. And, and this is just like uh, the, 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 the method from the improved uh, DDPM paper, the, the one I showed you in the beginning of the video, okay? So here's the sampling function. This is our desired shape. We wanna have one, three, 64, 464 images. This is the image we want to generate. Uh, this is kind of empty. Okay, let's enter this function and let's see how it works. Okay, before that, let me just enable the breakpoints. So enable all breakpoints. Okay, now we can enter that here. Let me enter. And here we are. So first of all, there's going to be this um, P sample loop progressive. Uh, basically, this thing is going to keep on producing the samples. Uh, we pass in the model, uh, we pass in the desired, desired shape, uh, noise is none, we don't pass anything here, we don't specify this, blah, blah, blah. This is just boilerplate, I'm gonna ignore all of that. So here we are, P sample, loop progressive. Uh, again, we just pick a device, uh, it's gonna be GPU, in my case, because I have uh, like GPU here. Um, then we generate the image. So here's how we start. We literally start with the Gaussian noise. So this is your, your normal distribution. So, so basically Gaussian with mean zero and variance one, okay? With the desired shape on the desired device. Let's generate that image. Now we have some number of time steps, which is set to 100. Again, I think I just modified this for the sake of, of time. Otherwise, I think default was a bit bigger, like 4,000. Um, in any case, so we generate the indices and you can see here we reverse them because now we are doing the uh, the reverse process. We start with the uh, 99, with the index 99 and we go all the way to zero, which is the original image. When I say original image here, this is a generated image from the underlying data distribution that we learned during the training procedure. That's the, that's the idea there. Okay, let's th step over here. So let's go over the indices. We start with the index 99. So this is gonna be first 99, okay? We kinda, um, well, you can see here, because batch dimension is one, nothing fancy happens here. But otherwise, if you wanted to generate like five images in the batch, then you would just copy paste uh, 99 five times because uh, for all of, the, all of the noisy images will be following the same process. So that's where we start with, with the last time step, okay? 
And in this function is where all of the magic actually happens. Everything else was kind of boilerplate, so let's, so let's focus on this one. So we pass the image, which is again, in the initial point, so now in the initial step, it's gonna be just pure image, pure, sorry, pure noise. We pass the time step, uh, blah, 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 nothing fancy there. Let's enter the P sample. And here is how the sampling works. And actually we already saw this during the training. So you pretty much know how this is gonna work. Let me enter here. Uh, this is that part of code where we were literally computing the, um, we split the model output and model variance then we compute those mean log, max log, so that's the equation, I saw the equation 15 from the paper, we get the variance, and then later down below, what we do is we uh, basically predict the x0, and then use that uh, to, to compute model mean. So we, we already kind of stepped through this code, so I'm not gonna do that now. So yeah, because of that, let me kind of uh, step over here, and ignore this. So I'm gonna just kind of uh, disable all of the breakpoints. Let me disable all of the breakpoints. Let me step to here and let me click F5 to step over. Okay, we end up here. Uh, now I'm gonna enable the breakpoints again. In any case, so we generate the noise. Again, this is your normal distribution. Uh, we generate these masks. Uh, which basically are always gonna be one if t is equal is different from zero. Because we treat the zero the zero step uh, differently. If you recall, even during the training, we had that NLL loss uh, as opposed to variational lower bound loss. Similarly here, when we, when we sample, we're gonna have a bit different behavior depending on the number of time steps. So we just take the mean, that's the mean we computed, and then we take the log variance, we do the exp, exp and log cancel out, we get the variance, we multiply that with the noise, and we end up with a sample, okay? So this is, now we are in step 98, okay? And we're gonna keep on doing this until we get a completely denoised image. And at the end, once we end up with the zeroth time step, this is gonna be equal to zero, and that means the only result we'll return is the final mean. Again, that's just a detail of how this thing works. And we return the sample, that's it. Basically, the sample now becomes image that we feed into the next iteration of this p sample function, and that's how it pretty much works. I'm gonna now stop this, because you pretty much saw everything. I'm gonna go to launch, I'm going to go to sample, I'm gonna increase the number of diffusion steps to let's say 500, and I'm gonna run the script again and just show you the uh, results we get. This time I'm gonna disable all of the breakpoints, I'm gonna run this and just show you how the results look like. Let me see, yeah, I added this image show plot show uh, line so that we can uh, visualize the actual sample and yeah, I'll, I'll get back to you as soon as the image is generated. Okay guys, here's the image. Um, we got some dog image again do do keep in mind that I only have uh, 500 uh, steps. Uh, it'd be much better if I used uh, more steps, obviously like 1,000. Although there is some bug with this code. When you use 4,000, you can check out the issue in, in their repo. Uh, basically, you get like completely saturated image. So that means that the optimum quality of an image is maybe around 1,000, 2,000 or something. But like at 4,000 images hit the saturation point and you get like just pretty much junk out of these of this model. Uh, guys, this is pretty much it. Uh, hopefully you found this format of a video useful. Do let me know whether you find it useful. Uh, if so, I'll keep on making videos such as this one, combining papers, combining code, putting code and papers side by side, uh, trying to make these abstract mathematical ideas a bit more uh, grounded and hopefully I've done a job at doing that. In any case, if you found this video useful, do share it out with others who want to learn more about diffusion processes. Uh, subscribe to this channel, join the Discord community, you can find the link down below in the video description. And until next time, bye bye.